Welcome in person and virtually to the 2021 Campbell Lecture. I'm Megan McDonald, an Associate Professor of Kinesiology and the Early Childhood Research Core Director here at the Center. The generous support of Cynthia and Duncan Campbell allows for this annual lecture series focused on childhood relationships, risk, and resilience. We are thrilled this year to be hosting Dr. Leah Robinson from the School of Kinesiology at the University of Michigan. Excuse me. She is also the Assistant Director of the Michigan Institute for Clinical Health Research, KL2 program, and a fellow with the American College of Sports Medicine. Her research takes a developmental perspective in motor skill acquisition, physical activity, and developmental health in preschool and school-age children. Her work seeks to understand the underlying mechanisms of motor skill acquisition because these salient skills are needed to be physically active across the lifespan. And her work explores the association an effect of motor skills and coordination on other health-related constructs like developmental and behavioral outcomes. Overall, overall, excuse me, her research aims to investigate how motor skills contribute to children's developmental trajectories. Impressively, she has published over 100 peer-reviewed articles and has received more than $14 million in grant funding from organizations such as the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Education. She serves as an associate editor for Medicine and Sport in Sports and Ex Med Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. <laughs> and in her leisure time, she enjoys golfing with friends, traveling, and the theater. And what you were not able to read from her bio um, is that she is our very own Dr. Sam Logan's former PhD mentor. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Robinson will present for about 45 to 50 minutes, allowing at least 10 minutes for questions um, with, with the intention of wrapping up within the one hour time frame. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Leah Robinson to Oregon State University and the Campbell Lecture Series. Thank you. Hello, um, thank you, Megan, for that warm introduction. And I'm happy to be here. This is like um, the first, verse, first live um, presentation have given in like two and a half years so um, it's I was excited when I received the invite of this potentially being in person and not online so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my research um, the title is motor competence a building block for healthy developmental trajectories in children so I have to first say that research is not an individual sport um, it takes a team and I am, have been grateful for the past 14 years to be surrounded by um, a group of individuals that we all have a common focus and common goal and help push my research agenda along. So my current research team that consists of undergrad, graduate students, staff and personnel, and also my former doc students, um, their own Sam Logan, who is my first PhD student, um, Kip Webster, Kara Palmer, Kay, um, Katie Andrews, and a postdoc, um, Sana um, Vandum, that you know, they are individuals who help push me along and keep me innovative in the work that I do. So I have to thank all of them for helping me be who I am today. So I'm going to talk briefly about, you know, child development, which is probably a commonly known here, but I won't go too much into it, but how my, mainly my research relates to it. Motor competence and motor skills, some critical points about motor skills, the intervention that we do that's, center, that's the center of my research we call CHAMP, and then some of our findings and future directions for myself and our current projects in our lab. So when we look at the domains of child development, there's four core areas. We have emotional development where um, individuals um, that focus on the ability to assess for young kids to regulate their own internal emotions and read cues from people. Um, cognitive domain, which focuses on mental processes. We have the social, how we interact with one another. And lastly, the physical and motor domain, which is our ability to use our senses, um, you know, taste, touch, Etc. along with our gross and fine motor skills um, that, you know, in terms of our surrounding and well-being. And my research really focuses on how this physical and motor domain, specifically motor skills, can hopefully um, evolve and, and impact some of these other areas of child development. 
So when we look at motor competence, it's a term that has been globally used to describe the level uh, in which we execute fundamental motor, motor skills. Um, motor skills are very critical um, to our social, emotional, and cognitive development of young children. And the foundation of the development of motor competence and motor skills, we usually, we theorize that it should happen during a critical time um, of those early childhood years. So those preschool years, those formative years early in school where it's important for individuals to get a strong foundation in these skills to continue to build upon them as they grow across their lifespan. Um, so when we're born, we have these types of skills that we initially have, these reflective or spontaneous movement um, that are used to protect us when we're born from falling, to help us with feeding, the sucking reflex. And as we grow, we develop these more functional and rudimentary skills, such as crawling around, scooting, creeping from one place to another. With um, age, we start to then focus on this skill acquisition period, so usually, usually between age three to six, where we want individuals or young kids to focus on developing some of those gross fundamental motor skills, such as running, catching objects with their hands, um, you know, kicking a ball with their feet. So we call those some of these basic fundamental motor skills. And these are critically important because a child then, as they get older, start applying these skills to more complex movements. So um, context and sports with specific skills, such as um, catching a basketball and dribbling down a court and then shooting it, um, striking a ball with a bat. So we start to take these basic skills and they build into this more advanced movement repertoire. And then lastly, as we get older in terms of our adult years, we continue to refine these skills and engage in lifetime physical activity. For example, I um, recently got more involved with golf, so I'm now refining those skills relating to golf, and I also started playing pickleball. So <laughs> these are skills that are, you know, pickleball striking an object with a ball and a racket. I'm moving my body from place to place. These are basic skills that I acquired as a child, but I'm still refining them and engaging in lifetime physical activity. And so that's why these basic motor skills are critically important when we look at across our lifespan, because we going will be engaging in movement for um, um, a good period of time. So this is just a recap about motor skills. They are building blocks uh, for more specific and advanced skills, and they include skills such as um, propelling your body through space, locomotor skills, um, and also objects to propel and manipulate with your hands and your feet, so ball skills. And there's three critical factors that we have found in some of the work we have done in our lab related to motor skills. One was a meta-analysis conducted by Sam when he was a student, when he looked at all the intervention work that has been done and to see what happens to the kids who didn't receive the control, did not receive the intervention, so the control participants, and those compared to those who were in the treatment groups. And he found that regardless, there was no changes in control groups' motor skills. So it really does show that most Motor skills are these skills that don't naturally emerge, that there was no significant improvements happening there, that these skills must be taught, practiced, and reinforced um, through some type of treatment intervention or some type of way to bring about changes. Um, so motor skill interventions are an effective approach to promote skill development. The second one that him and Kep Webster were part of was a systematic review that really looked at this relationship between motor skills and physical activity. And they found that during the early childhood years that there was a sex difference that was happening where ball skills were more related to um, girls and physical activity and locomotor skills and boys. But then as they hit puberty, it switched in that ball skills started becoming you know, more related um, in terms of boys and their engagement in physical activity and we think that might be due to sports participation and sports engagement but that was just anecdotal conclusion there but we need to delve further and figure out more and then lastly the next critical point is that um, motor skills are related to health outcomes. So following up on some earlier work from Dave Stodden, we wanted to see how are skills related to various health measures and health outcomes. And we found that there is a positive relationship between skills and physical activity. 
There's also uh, a positive relationship that exists between uh, motor skills and physical fitness. So cardiovascular fitness, muscular strength and endurance, which are critically important to our health. And then lastly, that kids who are more competent in their motor skills had better weight status. So this is again, seeing how all of these factors are uh, critical to our overall health and well-being. So for me, in my work that I always wanted to bring about change in individuals, so I wanted to focus on an intervention that can lead to improvements in motor skills in young kids. So when we think about um, interventions, one that we I now call CHAMP, Children's Health Activity Motor Program, um, what is the best way to bring about positive change in young kids that can lead to skill development? So I, I looked at the work of Cal, Cal, Carol Ames and Dwick, um, and they did a lot of work with achievement goal theory and um, in the classroom setting with preschoolers. And with achievement goal theory, it states that individuals take either a mastery approach to learning or a performance approach. Mastery when they really want to focus in on a task and they are intrinsically driven to learn. Um, they use self-reference um, goals in terms of their um, development and learning in that environment. And more performance are ego-oriented individuals or climates is where you are really concerned with the outcome of the movement. I want to outperform the person next to me. And that's usually not the best in an early childhood environment because it's kind of <laughs> detrimental. So I wanted to take this approach and apply it to movement. They have been successful in the classrooms. It's like the high scope curriculum, but I wanted to now apply it, apply it to more of a movement based environment. So with um, the mastery approach, we sit, we, situ we situate around these six target structures task of providing individuals with a variety of learning opportunity and, and learning task and environment. Authority is that you're giving this child really the control to make decisions. I'm more of a facilitator. We're not gonna stay at this station for five minutes and then move to the next movement station. You have the opportunity as a child to decide if I want to do activity A or activity B or activity C. Um, recognition, we really focus on the intrinsic development of the individual. We don't compare and say, oh, Megan, you are better than uh, Megan M. I'm sorry, that's not a good example. But we don't do comparison. I would go to Megan individually and say, Megan, you're doing a wonderful job today. I like the way you're participating and you're engaging in the environment. Keep up the great work and give her some critical um, feedback on her performance versus saying, Megan, you're doing so much better than Megan, your friend. You, you are putting her to shame. You don't want to you know, make it more detrimental to a young individual. Um, grouping, they decide how they would like to participate. Either you can participate by yourself, um, boy to boy, girl to boy. The child decides how they want to navigate the environment. Evaluation, again, aligns with recognition, looking at the individual characteristic, and then time varies. They can decide how they want to engage. And I will describe this later on in another slide. And we align our CHAMP program to um, align with these target structures by giving them a variety of tasks that range in difficulty. You know, the student is a decision maker. I'm just there to guide them and to encourage them to engage and to handle any situations that might evolve. We avoid social comparison, recognize individual progress and, and so forth. So with CHAMP, we really focus on basic fundamental motor skills. So these are the skills we really focus on enhancing and developing in young kids along with physical activity. And since they're given the autonomy to really engage on their own, we feel that they enable individuals to create goals and strategies for themselves. They make their own decisions. They decide how do they manage that movement environment. They monitor their own behavior. They do this own self-correction. Um, when, as we provide them feedback. Um, they have to navigate on their own and manage their emotions. So this is a little bit of the linkage to some of those underlying constructs of self-regulation that I will talk to later. And all of this is why they're actively engaging in that process of learning motor skills. 
So um, for our, this would just be an example of how activities are set up. So if we were doing a catching activity within um, one of our sessions, we would have a variety of equipment that make it easy and difficult. So it's a lot easier to catch scarves and balloons because they float very slow in the air and compared to catching balls of various sizes and weights. So we have a variety of difficulty there where a child can say, I might want to do something a little bit easy or I want to do something harder. And then also the lesson plan is set up in terms of a child can decide, do I want to do something easier by tossing the ball to myself, the balloon or the scarf, or do a harder task of tossing an actual ball that has more a different trajectory, a tactile to it? Or do I want to toss with a partner at different distances, short, far, or move, doing lateral movements? So we try to create the activities that range in difficulties for each of the individuals. So this gives an example of how we might set up a recess period or a gym class for individuals. So we would have three to four different stations. So here would be rolling. We have underarm, over, underarm, under, overarm, underarm throwing here, and on the far side, a locomotor obstacle course. So again, it's different levels. So the closer the, the ball, the hole to them, the easier it is, or the farther they send from the mats. You know, they can do any type of throwing to different hoops and they can do it either underarm or overarm. The distance is ranging in their difficulty. And then on the far side is the obstacle course that includes sliding. You have hopping here where they can hop on the easier. Um, the boards are different heights or on the cones, stepping over those. And then log rolling and other activities. So again, they have multiple stations set up and then we want to range in the difficulty in what they engage in within those stations. So some are our findings. Um, so I originated this idea with achievement goal theories and movement programs way back during my, P my PhD. So this is the first two papers I'm gonna present is actually work from my dissertation. So it is possible for work from your dissertation to be your career work. <laughs> so <laughs> that is possible. So um, with this, um, I worked with my advisor at Ohio State, Jackie Goodway, and I wanted to do work with Head Start program because I'm just passionate about those programs. So we had about 117 individuals that were enrolled in my um, dissertation, yep, about 117, and they were randomly um, assigned to either a low autonomy group that's more strict in terms of making comparison between the children. It's typically what you see in a physical education class. They're waiting in line to get the ball to you know, to participate, or they're spending five minutes at this station and then we move and rotate to the next station. Um, so that is the blue color here. We had CHAMPS, which is the um, Achievement Goal Theory Intervention Approach for Motor Skills, and then a comparison group who just remained outside and in outdoor recess, so they didn't receive any type of formalized intervention or instruction. So all the individuals started off at the same at pretest, which is what we expected. Um, both the CHAMP and the low autonomy group had significant improvements from pre to post, and also um, there was a slight decline from post to retention. So um, we had the intervention, and then there was like a 10-week period where they did not receive any type of intervention, but we wanted to follow up and test them. And as you see with the control group, there was no changes in their ball skills from pre, post to retention. They just remained pretty flat and stagnant. And stagnant. We also wanted to look at the effect, um, want to explore on, their, on the children's self-perception. So perceived competence is pretty important to young kids. It's how they perceive their ability to do a certain task. So specifically, we explored perceived motor competence. And this was quite interesting to me in that the CHAMP group in yellow had significant improvements and they maintained that perceived competence from after the intervention to retention. And despite the low autonomy group having improvements in their, oops, went up, the, having improvements in their motor skills on the previous slide, their self-perceptions remained the same. They remained flat. There was no improvements from pre to post to retention, similar to the control groups. So even though they receive improvements in their skills, so they get that formalized instruction, their motor skills improve, there was something happening to them in terms of that environment 
um, in terms of their psyche that did not promote their self-perceptions at all. It was kind of detrimental in terms of skills improvement, but their self-perception and their ability to move did not improve. So um, the next piece to my dissertation was that I wanted to then follow up and see what happens because we had this control group th that didn't have anything for, you know, the intervention period that was about 15 weeks, a 10 week retention. They didn't have any type of in any type of treatment. What happens if we go back and give this treatment to the control group? So we gave the treatment to the control group. Hit or go here. Pre-test, post-test, retention intervened and gave them the motor skills, the same intervention, and they had similar gains to the same amount as the kids in the original CHAMP group. So again, this is where the control participants received the CHAMP intervention. And what happened to their perceived competence? Similar. Um, you can see here that again, from pre, post, or retention, no changes. Once we gave them that intervention, the self-perceptions improved significantly. So again, shows and reinforce that, okay, maybe these low autonomy approaches might not be the best to um, help with the psychological wellness of young kids. And um, again, also reinforces the need for some type of formalized instruction in terms of motor skill development. So after, I graduated, I moved to Auburn University and um, luckily had the opportunity to work with Mary Rudisell, who is very big also in achievement goal theory and interventions. She's one of the reasons why I went there to continue on um, as a faculty member. And we received an R03 grant with looking at these types of approaches in kids in um, K through second grade. And we really mainly focused on physical activity for her, this, her, this project. And we found that the CHAMP intervention was effective in promoting um, more physical activity in both boys and girls compared to the, the, the um, control kids. And also they had seven more minutes of physical activity. Um, we used um, so, so fit to assess and step count pedometers to look at the physical activity during this, during this program. and I keep going the wrong way in my slides. Um, later, um, myself and my doc students, um, Sam, Kip, Kara, and our research tech, we did a project that looked at um, this, the effect of CHAMP and um, low autonomy approaches in terms of physical activity. And we also got the same similar findings in that individuals in CHAMP, again, this gold color, engage in more walking and vigorous in moderate to vigorous physical activity compared to those in the low autonomy group. Um, and then also those in a low autonomy group spent more time standing. So again, reinforcing that this approach is effective in promoting physical activity and skill development along with psychological um, perceived competence, psychological wellness in young, young individuals. Um, recently, um, one thing that Kara and I were questioning is, are kids learning at the same rate? You know, so typically when we have interventions, we have seen in the past that boys tend to start above girls and girls never quite catch up to the boys in, in terms of the skill piece and the learning piece. So we wanted to see if CHAMP could be an effective way, a way to see our, our kids learning at similar rates. And we found that they do in this, in this type of approach. Um, they had similar gains in their motor skills when we look at, pre, you know, they were similar at pretest, and then boys and girls, um, they both had higher scores and they aren't learned equally. Um, the CHAMP intervention was equally effective for boys and girls. Um, what would have been great if we were to had in a third condition that was more low autonomy, so we can make that comparison to see if um, this intervention approach or is it the type of intervention that leads to that effective learning. So that's something that we could potentially explore down the road. But that was good to see initially that there are learning and champs specifically at similar rates and we're not leaving the girls behind. Um, this then led me to start thinking about, I met a developmental psychologist and, um, and she had an interest in the movement piece. I had an interest in learning more in terms of developmental health outcomes in young kids. So we started collaborating together. 
So um, her name was Kristen Bubb, and she had access to the um, NICHD child, Early Child Care and Youth Development Study, where we wanted to look at you know, relationships between self-regulation, which is critically important to human development and child development, um, our ability to regulate our behaviors and actions and emotions, um, and how this relates to health outcomes. So we found that um, in this study that children with better self-regulation at um, third grade had better health outcomes. Um, the same was also true as they get older to sixth grade. Again, if kids who are able to self-regulate, again, have better health outcomes as measured by, I should say, BMI. And then also this was maintain, maintained as they even got older into those, pre, those adolescent years. So it really was my first look into understanding how these um, other domains of child development relates to our physical health and well-being. So kids can self-regulate better. They tend to have you know, these better health outcomes in this project here. So that led us to explore more in terms of this area. And <clears throat> we wanted to see expanded it to look at, we didn't have any money at the time, so we had to do something that was cost effective with um, myself, Kara Palmer, and Mac Millen, Miller, and um, looking at sustained attention and response inhibition, and we used a picture deletion task. This is a task that did not cost money to reproduce in young kids. Um, and what they were given, they, they served at their, their own control, so we did a within subject design where they had a, 30 minute champ session, and then we observed their, um, um, we, they completed a picture deletion task, and then they also had a sedentary time when they had a story read to them in both conditions. And we saw that they um, had better attention, less errors on this picture deletion task on days, on a day that they would receive the intervention, the 30 minute movement program of CHAMP. So that made us start thinking of, is there something about the movement of the intervention or is it actually just going outside being physically active? So digging deeper and figuring out more what's happening. So that led um, Kristen and myself along with Kara to look at um, how our CHAMP intervention could relate to skills and motor skills and both delayed a gratification. Um, so again, you see here, looking at kids started at the same for motor skill development. They received, um, I believe this was probably about eight week intervention that was every day of the week. So about, I think 600 or so minutes. Um, control kids, just regular outdoor recess, no improvements, but you see a significant improvement in the preschoolers' motor skills for those who received the CHAMP program. In terms of delay of gratification, we use the um, snack delay task for this assessment. And what we found was that kids in one group were, there was no significant difference of where they started at between the treatment and control, but the kids in the treatment were pretty at the top of the assessment. So 3.8 and there's a max of four on this assessment. So they're at the top. But they didn't improve, but they did maintain their delay of gratification. Whereas the kids who had outdoor recess had a significant decline in their delay of gratification. So that made us start to think more of, is it the intervention that is causing some of these changes in behavior regulation since kids are regulating themselves within CHAMP versus outdoor recess when they're just a free for all and do what they want to do or they're in this environment where the teacher is not really engaging them to actively manage their bodies, manage their emotion, manage their behavior. So we begin delving deeper and I'm becoming more interested in that piece. So to summarize that, um, we, so we found that some of our CHAMP um, work supports that behavior regulation and the maintenance of, of delayed gratification. We have found that it helps kids sustain their attention in preschool age kids. We have not done anything with social, the, the social domain and social development, how to interact with others. And then also, of course, the physical and motor domain with improving the motor skills, increasing physical activity and perceived competence. And all of this work led me now to um, what I have been funded from NIH to explore. 
So um, one of our first projects we have that is in um, its final year is, we call it PATH, um, pr um, Promoting Activities and Trajectories of Health for Children. And it was a, um, a clinical trial for about um, 300 preschoolers. I think 300 was our end, we ended with 303. Um, and we wanted to look at the effects of CHAMP on motor competence, physical activity, and perceived competence. Um, this, we started this pre-COVID, so we were able to get through most of the study. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> year three and year four, we were unable to follow these kids. We started at preschool, went and followed them through kindergarten and um, first grade, but because of COVID, we were unable to get the first grade and the second grade year because a lot of them just dispersed. They started moving, and we just could not um, follow them and keep track of them. But some of the initial findings that we found was that um, looking at um, within, within group differences right now, um, the control group that is here in the um, yellow, they significantly, there was significant improvement in their motor skills from pre to post, you see here slightly, and then also um, CHAMP group had significant improvements in their motor skills also from pre to post. They started off about the same, but there you see that CHAMP had a little bit greater improvement that I will discuss on the next slide. Um, there's also um, improvements in CHAMP from, in the control group from, I'm sorry, not CHAMP, the control group from pre to post right here. Um, this is time point two to the follow-up period, so pre, post, follow-up and the same is for the kids in the control group. Looking at between differences, it's a little bit um, different. Um, at T2, the CHAMP group had significantly higher motor skills, so after the intervention, than the control group. And at T3, the CHAMP group continued to have um, higher motor skills, but they did have a slight decrease. So we see that there is still development happening for kids in the control group that do not have any type of formalized instruction for their motor skills. And so they are improving because they're growing, they're developing, they're probably engaging in motor skills at home with their family. Um, but it's not to the same degree of if they have some type of formalized instruction. So that's one thing I reinforce that kids are going to develop, but are we giving them the, the optimum environment for the development and motor skills help to give them that optimum environment. Um, we haven't yet, we're still processing our physical activity and our um, Motor, uh, perceived competence data. Um, sadly, our PA data is not panning out well. Um, and it's because, you know, we unfortunately couldn't really figure out, you know, assess what's happening in the home environment. You know, do they go to parks? Do they live close to parks? So that is not looking as fruitful as we hope it would be, but we hope to have that finish, finish analyzing pretty soon. Um, the second piece of this grant was I worked with a developmental psychologist, Allison Miller. She's a person who, again, is interested in the motor side. I'm interested in the child development piece. And we wanted to explore more from the self-regulation standpoint. So looking at how this intervention would have an effect on um, working memory, cognitive flexibility, behavior regulation, and emotional regulation. And we use, of course, Megan's assessment that she will have done a lot of validity on the head, toes, knees, and shoulder task for behavior regulation. Dimensional card sorting for cognitive flexibility, a Mr. Ant task for working memory, and um, the teachers completed an emotional checklist for emotional regulation. And for this, we found that it has only, was that only the HTKS behavior regulation? <laughs> 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 where um, there was um, a significant difference between treatment and control, where the kids in the treatment group had significantly um, better scores, um, less zeros than the ones in the control group. Um, the Mr. Ant and the cognitive flexibility, we think that you know this now plays in the piece of these are more cognitive aspects, and that when where in a lot of literature, cognitive um, these measures are related to more MVPA and physical activity. 
where this behavior regulation might not be as closely linked to the physical activity piece, it's more of what's happening in the environment in terms of that type of instructional approach that we are doing. So we really want to now dig deeper and try to figure out what is happening, what constructs of the intervention really helps to enhance these behavior regulation measurements in kids, which are critically important, um, along with the um, cognitive flexibility and working memory. Um, our current project, which we hope to get off the ground um, soon, we're scheduled to start in November, is now looking, um, taking this CHAMP program and moving it to after school. So most of the work we have done has been in preschool populations, but now seeing what happens in older populations, do we get the same outcome? So looking at CHAMP um, in after school program, and something different here is also we are gonna train the after school staff to implement it. So in the past and all of our other interventions, which is a huge limitation, is that we're intervening the program. I'm instructing it, or my research scientists, we are the ones doing it. And so now we want to see, can we train school personnel to actually implement the program to the same degree as ours, uh, as we do as researchers, and get the similar outcomes in terms of physical fitness, physical activity, motor skills, and perceived competence. And this is a project that's going to be at two sites, um, Ann Arbor and Lansing, and with um, my colleague Karen Pfeiffer, who's at Michigan State um, University. So in terms of some of the future work that we um, are doing and that I want to continue to do is really to dig deeper and figure out what is going on in terms of our intervention approach approach and behavior regulation in young kids. So looking more at some of those developmental health outcomes. Um, how, what piece of the intervention is leading to these positive changes and how do they relate to the total development of the child. Also, I have an interest in translation and sustainability. I can't keep doing this for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So how can we train other individuals, school staff, PE teachers, to deliver in, um, this intervention effectively to others and they can reach more masses of people. Um, implementing in diverse populations and diverse settings, I um, have been getting some inquiry from um, agencies about this intervention that is effective in promoting skills and these other constructs in young kids. Can it be applied to aging population and support healthy aging in seniors? So that's something that I, I am it, trying to find a, the perfect collaborator to help me really try to go deeper in terms of is this a suitable approach for um, aging populations. And then lastly, the, um, two more, optimum dose and timing. We don't quite know what is an optimum dose because we have some kids who respond great to this and some kids who are like not responders. So what is a type of dose and a timing that we need to make this to fine tune the treatment? Mm -hmm. Typically we do about 1,500 to 1,800 minutes of instruction, but does a person who have lower motor skills, do they need more time or do they need less time? So what is the optimum dose and the timing that it should be delivered? And then lastly, looking at the, um, the brain behavior connection, really how you know, the brain and what, um, when they get these motor interventions, how is this changing the, this, the brain activity in terms of linking it to some of those self-regulation contracts, um, you know, attention, the ability, their working memory. So working with hopefully an individual in neuroscience or motor control, motor learning, who really can understand with FNIRs and other types of activity, what is happening with that brain motor connection in terms of this CHAMP program and, um, and stuff. So again, I have to acknowledge my current students in my lab. So I have three students who, one's looking for a job, in case you're looking for somebody with, who's a PT <laughs> and does adaptive stuff. Um, and my two students and my other staff members in the lab, undergrad students are a key component of our lab. They are eager and ready to learn. Um, a lot of the papers we have published include undergrad students because I give them the rams if there's something they want to do to help out their CV for professional schools, let's get it out the door. And um, that's my contact information and just a sly advertisement in case anybody's <laughs> looking for a PhD. I am potentially looking for one for 2012. So uh, I know I have a meeting with doc students later on, our graduate students. So 
if you know of anyone, let me know about PhD students. So that's all I have for today. Thank you. Questions? Um, it, that was that was awesome, and Thank I have you. a million other questions, but I will focus today um, on one of them. Um, you mentioned the emotion regulation checklist in the in the most recent, but um, I'm assuming either you didn't you haven't looked at that yet, or nothing interesting, and just wanted to ask. Yeah, we have not. Um, Allison Miller is still working on that piece of the data, um, but I believe so. I don't know for sure, but I know when we did. Um, write up this paper. I think only the one that was the most benefit uh, that we saw an effect of the treatment was in the um, HTKS, the behavior regulation one. But I know she has not really delved deeper into um, the teacher checklist. So, awesome. yeah. and, do you, and I might want to talk to you about other ways to probably look at um, that measure besides using teachers. So, yeah, much. and you know, just just thinking about the thing that you you closed with as well, and just really thinking about how individual kids might differ and how they even approach those kind of social situations. Mm -hmm. And you might be able to pick up on some of that with yeah. the ERC measure and oh, yeah. how they, you know, the approach versus a withdrawal, withdrawal sort of from, um, yeah. from a temperamental standpoint. Yeah, and I think that would be a great way because we haven't done anything with social interactions yeah. during our um, yeah. intervention. So really try to figure out how can we look at how this might affect kids' social development and social skills. But that's has I have not found a doc student who might have an interest <laughs> in that piece yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> or a postdoc. Yeah. So. <laughs> this was awesome. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Yes. I have a follow-up. Sorry, I'm going to <laughs> questions too, but um, so just about the the teacher stuff, we often don't find that the the scale of the teacher ratings also doesn't often capture enough variability mm. to d to really document the change. Mm -hmm. So like this, uh, it's so it's so fascinating to see the progression of your research, and I hope the grad students who are listening and are 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 noting this because. It's similar to how we developed our own intervention, mm -hmm. you know, over time. And so I'm like, oh, goody. I think maybe we're, we're on the same thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's fantastic. But we also didn't find a lot of evidence for teacher rating change. But when you look at the mm -hmm. scaling of it, it's really hard to show, demonstrate. It's not um, fine-grained enough, I think, to demonstrate the developmental change. That, okay. You know, so yeah, the direct assessments on the HDCAS, like, we really sh see a lot of a that there. there. Mm -hmm. But it's one thing to think about. It's hard to get at emotion regulation in a direct assessment. So mm. I know there are some measures actually that I okay. can chat about. But anyway, I know Allison, so. Yes, yeah. she's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah, I love Allison. Anyway, sorry, I'll shut up. Other questions or online? I have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just looking at my notes, but you'd mentioned, so Champ, at one point um, you talked, well, you ended with sort of looking at dose, but I heard 600 minutes and then 1,500 mm -hmm. to 800. So how did that evolve over time? Yeah. yeah, so typically when we are focusing on probably just um, one of the studies that was 600 minutes, we just focused on, I think, um, ball skills. So right. if we're doing an uh, intervention that's not looking at total motor skills, object control, ball skills, and locomotor, we probably have between 600 and 700 minutes. And then the more in terms of we want to have at least you know, um, to make sure we have enough time to capture both ball and object control. I'm sorry, ball and locomotor Locomotive skills. And so works. those are ones that's about 1,500 minutes. And was there, remind me again, was it typically usually six to eight weeks or did that also vary? That also varies based on the time. Um, so usually we um, do like a semester, mm -hmm. but that includes pre-testing and post-testing. Um, but the shorter interventions of less minutes is, is a shorter amount of time mm -hmm. since we don't need a full semester to yeah. do what we need to do. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have one back here and then I'll pass off. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. There you go. Hi, yeah, so I had a question about um, the kids that you study, the mm -hmm. kiddos. Uh, what kind of like range and abilities to have, like have you ever looked at any with developmental disabilities? Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing in terms of self-regulation mm -hmm. and like the motor development, there's some high needs there, yeah. but they differ. So I was just yeah. curious if you've ever like captured yeah. that or. Yeah, definitely. Um, our work is mainly on typically developing um, populations. Um, in terms of um, special needs, they are a part of the program, but we usually don't include them in terms of the assessment. So they can participate and engage, but the work is funded to focus on typically developing, which is a limitation to a, a lot of our work, so, but yeah. 
CJ, did you have a question? Is he here? Go ahead, CJ. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was especially interested in the self-perception and like your role when you're doing the champ because mm -hmm. I know dealing with kids and even when you start talking about adults the self-perception can really like stop the engagement mm -hmm. so as an do you find some of them withdraw when you're doing that or yeah, so we approach the individuals um, so we make sure we don't have any comparison between them and somebody else and really target on what they're doing. So I'll be like, you know, Megan, you know, you're doing wonderful today. I see how you are stepping forward with opposition as you're throwing. You know, why don't you try bringing your arm back farther next time you throw? So really approaching them in a positive light versus saying, Megan, you need to bring your arm back farther when you throw. <laughs> you know, so it's just the dialogue that we have with them. Um, to encourage them to, you know, have that positive side of movement versus being told, you know, no or they're not doing well, just ways to make it and refine and make it better. Yeah. Oh, Sam. <laughs> I've been waiting 10 years to get on this side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, <laughs> I was just curious, you know, we always talk about the connection between motor competence and physical activity, mm -hmm. and there was a new paper that came out and suggested that that link might not be as That's strong right. as we thought, mm -hmm. and I think some of those authors were surprised, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I was surprised given dynamic systems, a lot of different mm -hmm. factors happening, you know, nonlinear development. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious of your perspective on that. Of you know, were you as surprised as, as they were and kind of what's your take on that? Yeah, definitely surprised because, you know, we had this notion that skills are directly related to physical activity, but I think we're not looking at all the other factors that play into it. Um, it might be functional fitness and your functional ability and fitness levels that might be the ones that are linked to PA. So I, I think motor skills and competence I think they play a role, but I don't think it's, you know, we in the field of motor development said motor skills are directly related to PA and you have to have skills, but I think they're a contributing factor. And, you know, it's, you know, it's like you make a cake and you're going to put all the ingredients in the cake, but if you leave out the baking soda, then something's going to happen to the cake. So I think, you know, motor skills, activity, self-perceptions, physical fitness, all of those things are ingredients that we need everybody to have to engage in physical activity. Yeah. Um, no, it's not. It's not me. But I'm. I'm reading. I'm in charge of reading um, the Q and A from from the the audience. And Kathleen McDonald. Um, hi, Kathleen. Uh, who's the director of our Child Development Center here, <laughs> has a really great question. She says, if we were to do something like this, should it be done during recess or outside of recess? Mm -hmm. Kids yeah. still need to have some time for free play, but this would get those children who only want to play in the sandbox, <laughs> <laughs> it would get them moving a little. Yeah. Yeah, I am a definite advocate for recess. I feel that kids should have the opportunity to engage in free play, and that can have more interactions. Um, we usually do this as um, in preschool programs um, because they tend to have two recess periods, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So we take and replace one of the recess periods with more of a structured movement program. But I still encourage, like, are the kids going out to play today? Because I don't want the teachers to think that this one period is all they need for recess with us, that they still need to go outside and get that other 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes a day of outdoor recess. So. It would be great, you know, like in the school system, even though they have taken away recess in the schools, to have PE in preschool and recess in preschool, like they do in school age populations. But I don't know if we were, we'll get to that point. She yeah. said thanks. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this Thank great you. presentation. So my question actually builds off of Kathleen's. Mm -hmm. So Kathleen, if you're listening at home, this is Shauna. <laughs> um, <laughs> around translation and sustainability. So mm -hmm. in, in thinking about that being one of your next steps in terms of you can't yeah. be everywhere, you can't support everybody I and, know. and <laughs> continue to grow as, as Champ takes, takes yeah. wings and really gets out there. When you're thinking about that translation piece and building buy-in or mm -hmm. building excitement about programs saying, okay, we wanna do this, we mm -hmm. wanna train folks, we wanna make time for it. I'm curious about what you're hearing in terms of that buy in what are folks most excited yeah. about what of you know as yeah. researchers we look at things and say oh that that yeah what are the yeah. educators and then the flip side of what are some of the barriers yeah. to folks 
the the translation of sustainability that definitely keeps me up at night because <laughs> you you know it's hard you know preschool teachers are and school teachers in general are already stretched very thin um, so now you want us to do professional development training on skill development but I try to integrate it with them and say well the data supports that the more active your children are, the more you give them opportunities to go outside and move. When they come to the classroom, they're going to probably sit their little buns down and listen to you more. So I try to take that approach to them. But um, I want to hopefully probably start communicating with implementation scientists to see how do we go about doing this because I I don't have a clue of where to start. I be every time Megan talks, I listen in of how she's doing her um, her programs and curriculums. But working with implementation scientists, I think, would be the key to get the buy-in to really get teachers to know it, it can help your classroom in the long run, even though it might take a little bit of time and effort up front. Yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. So I'm Alexis, and I work on Megan's HTKS project and the intervention, which, mm -hmm. both, which both have a motor component mm -hmm. to them, and so I'm seeing a lot of parallels, but curious about the CHAMP program itself mm -hmm. and how you had kids pick the easy, there's options of easy to more difficult. Mm -hmm. Did that, was it the same kind of scale of easy to difficult every session, mm -hmm. and did you see kids changing how they, yeah. like, yeah. engaged in those options. Yeah. It's not the same scale. Um, and I know, um, I think Sam did a, one study of this was look at how kids engage. And that's something we do have all the video lessons taped for the R01 um, and really going back to see. So did Leah today do just easy? And then I did I do easy for a whole week or did I switch and do easy to hard? So really trying to understand some of those individual pathways that individuals took. So that's something that we have the tapes and the data, but we need to really just sit down and now it's kind of was it's a little hard to do since there's like, you know, 30 kids in a session. So really tracking that one individual yeah. throughout to see how they do it. But that's a great question. We really don't know the answer to, the, to that from the work that Mary Rudisil does in Auburn. Um, also Nadja Valentini in Brazil and myself, we are the three people who do a lot with these high autonomy achievement goal climates, but really trying to tweeze out and figure out how, what is the individual pathway of the child? And then how did that relates to their psychological makeup? So if I'm a kid who really likes challenging myself, do I just do the high level stuff, even though I'm not successful? Or do I do more moderate if I, you know, are lower level that I know I can experience success at? So that's something that would be great to have somebody explore and, and dig in, in that data and figure it out. Thank you. Yeah. Again, PhD students are postdocs. <laughs> So I think we need to collaborate because yes. this is Yay! also, this is Shauna's, <laughs> this is really came from Shauna Tomini's work early on, but our red light, purple light grant is mm -hmm. very similar, but has a cognitive component mm -hmm. and it strengthens the same kind of some of the skills you're interested mm -hmm. in. So anyway, we need to write a grant together. Yes, this would be super fun. So. Yay. This, and this, this, this trip was a success. I had no <laughs> idea. But I mean, this is a great, I mean, this is, I have been reading up on Megan's work um, since I got into self reg I'm like, who is this lady? <laughs> <laughs> and I have emailed you several times, and, and you, you respond very quickly. So when I get this opportunity to come here to speak, I'm like, I did not hesitate twice. I'm like, oh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And, <laughs> any final questions? Yes, I'll come back with the mic, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for the for the um, talk, thank and you. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I just I probably I missed the the first uh, part of your presentation mm -hmm. because I came a little bit late. No. Um, out of all the domains that are very important for child development, mm -hmm. why you, why did you choose motor, motor skills? Uh huh. Yes, definitely. All the domains are critically important for development. Um, for me, it goes back to my training academically so I was an athlete in high school and an athlete in college so I always had this concept of how does the body move um, so originally I wanted to work with professional athletes till I in college athletes until I actually worked with them and realized I did not um, but um, 
after my um, master's program, I taught for two years at a junior college, and um, they, part of my requirement was to teach their early childhood PE course, and we worked with the preschool center, and I was in this preschool, I saw kids who was tripping over their toes, they couldn't mm -hmm. catch a ball, they couldn't kick a ball, and these are skills for me as a, I thought was just everybody had these skills and then I started doing more research and research on the concept of kids needing some type of movement programs that these skills are not natural. I read some of my initial work of my, she was, became a PhD advisor, Jackie Goodway, her dissertation and that really got me thinking of, you know, there was a lot of work happening in terms of emotional development and social development but motor development in young kids was kind of like the unstudied area. And so that's where I really just got my passion about from being an athlete and knowing how to move to making sure that all kids know how to move. So it comes from there. Yep. Thank you. Any Thank final you. questions? All right. Well, um, please join me in thanking Dr. Robinson one Thank more you. time. Thank you so much.